Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. All of these machines are alike in many respects. Where there are differences, I will point them out on the individual machine. The first essential of proper typing technique is good posture. For good posture, your chair should have a firm back support. It should be low enough so that your feet rest flat on the floor, one foot ahead of the other to get the top of the There are numerous ways to work with your tech. Today you can get a relatively inexpensive computer to put in your home, and you can talk to it, or shout at it, and it will do what you say. Or you can hold the button on your smartphone and ask it a question. You can dictate to your laptop. You can search Google with an image. You can work with an ever-increasing army of bots on various services like Slack. Oh, one quick aside. Every time I hear the tech press absolutely losing their minds over bots and services, I wonder how many of those idiots have ever been on IRC. Bots and services? Had those for a while now, bucko. But of all the ways to, for lack of a better word, interface with your computer, typing things on a keyboard is still the king. You can double-click and mouse around and use your trackpad and Wacom, but sooner or later, you typically put your fingers on the keyboard. Fill out the web form, work up a document, enter some data into a worksheet, write some code, type and tap, and do your thing. But have you ever found yourself typing the same thing constantly? I mean, think about it. How many times do you type things like your email address, your name, your work address, and so on? Have you ever done something like misspelled your email because you've been in a hurry? Me, I have a nightmare scenario because my name is Dan. On the U.S. standard keyboard, the N and M keys are right next to each other, so... I'm scared to death that sooner or later, I'm going to send an email to someone very important and sign it, Thank you so much. Damn. You can't get away from typing. And you can only type so fast while maintaining accuracy. After all, if you're typing 100 words per minute, but you're only 75% accurate, then you're really only kind of typing 75 words per minute. You need to slow down and find a balance, maybe hovering around 80 words per minute or something. But what if you could improve on that? And I mean improve upon that right now. Like I said on the last show, aren't computers supposed to help us with this stuff? Well, as it happens, you can have your speed and your accuracy too. Welcome to the world of text expansion and automation. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 48, Typing Outside the Lines. I'm Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, welcoming you back to the show that explores the intersection of libraries and technology and is all about living that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Click, clack, moo, my friends. Cyberpunk Librarian is back with a new episode, streaking through the dark recesses of the net, over the darker magic of iTunes, and out of the rapidly disappearing headphone jacks on certain fruit branded smartphones. Hello, hi, and it's good to talk to you again from the cooling deserts of Arizona, where summertime ends in October, and unlike Westeros, winter never arrives here. So this time around, my friends, we're going to talk about text replacement via triggered events, or if you don't want to be so technical about it, text expansion. Now, I can picture a few of you out there nodding your heads and thinking, ah, yes, text expansion, mm. I use that on a daily basis, and it saves me time and errors. Then I can see some of you metaphorically scratching your head and wondering, text expansion, I don't want to expand anything. I want to type less. Isn't that text contraction? And then some of you are thinking, I wonder if she likes me. How am I ever going to talk to her? All I can say is, be yourself, Jennifer. Strike up a conversation about something you're both interested in and see what she's like. Sure, you'll be nervous, but maybe she is too. Just be friendly. Let go. And remember, 
you're a good person, she's a good person, and you two would make a lovely couple. For the rest of you, let's talk about how to make typing easier and more efficient. Jennifer will work things out on her own. Okay, so text expansion, for those who aren't familiar. I already gave you a stupidly technical definition in that text expansion is automating your typing through triggered events. To break that down into a sort of non-geek terminology, that means you can get a little app that runs on your computer. And you can tell that app that whenever you type a certain thing, delete that thing and replace it with another thing. The classical example that's often used is your email signature. Maybe you have two or three email accounts and you want to use a different email signature for each. So you set up a trigger that when you type SIG1, which, you know, SIG1 for his first signature or whatever, it replaces that with your first email signature. When you type SIG2, it replaces that with your second email signature, and so on. That way you're not typing the same signature over and over again. You're not doing any copying and pasting. You're just firing off an event based upon a thing that you typed. Now, if that sounds kind of simple, well, that's because it is. It doesn't make it any less useful. And besides, popping off an email signature is just the beginning. So let's do that thing that we so often do and break up the show into a couple parts. For the first part, I'm going to go over, you know, something really important. Text expansion software. After all, you can't really do text expansion without a little software, and unfortunately, there's nothing out there that's completely cross-platform. The good news is, there is something for every operating system, and while I'm going to focus on the desktop this time around, you can find solutions built right into iOS, and there are apps for Android. Then we'll hit up the things that you can do with the software, what I do, and hopefully what you can do too. At the very least, I hope you get some ideas to expand your text, which will, oddly enough, contract your workflow. All right then, let's get started. Like I said, I'm going to stick with the desktop this time around, so that means we need to look at text expander software for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Each operating system has goodies for it, and while they all work in a fairly similar way, you want to take some time to get familiar with it on your operating system of choice. Hit up the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com podcast, and you'll find links to all of these things that I'm about to talk about. So let's start with Mac OS because I literally rolled a die to pick the first one. Now, if you listen to podcasts at all, you really can't seem to help but hear about Text Expander from Smile Software. That's because they advertise on a bunch of podcasts along with another bit of kit they sell called PDF Pen. Text Expander recently updated to a subscription based model at a cost of $20 per year for current users to upgrade or $40 per year for new users. And there was a bit of a controversy around that, which I'm going to totally skip over because I don't care. Text Expander is so ubiquitous in its presence that many people, including me, call this kind of software a text expander just as a name for what it does, kind of like people call a flying disc a frisbee or calling an ibuprofen pill an Advil. If you're not looking to pay out that much money right away, then let me recommend what I use, which is a little app called Atext, that's lowercase a, capital T-E-X-T. It's five bucks, or four ninety nine, if you want to get technical, and I've used it for years. I've recently upgraded my, uh, my MacBook Air to macOS Sierra, and I can confirm that it's working fine on the newest operating system, and it was working fine on El Capitan too. Indeed, I've used it to help write part of the show notes. Atex does everything I need it to do, and then some, so I don't see anything lost from not using the more expensive text expander, but hey, your needs likely vary from mine. On the Windows side of the desk, there are a few more options, but I can't recommend any of them as highly as Phrase Express. Like so many software packages these days, that's Phrase Express with a capital P and an E and no space in between the words. 
just just hit the link in the show notes. It'll get you there. Anyway, I've used Phrase Express longer than I have a text, and it is, quite frankly, the best. Granted, that's my opinion, and I've got an alternative in a second if you want to try that out, too. Unlike a text and text expander on the Mac, Phrase Express is free for personal use. I've saved countless keystroke and hours of work with Phrase Express. So if you're looking to try text expansion in Windows, I'm willing to bet that this is your jam. On the other side, there's Brevi by 16 Software. Brevi looks and acts a lot like Phrase Express. Indeed, I can't find a lot of difference between the two. If you put both of them on the screen and I had to stand back you know, 20 feet or so, I probably couldn't tell which was which. It's $34.95 for the full version, but you can grab a trial version to see if you like it. Finally, on Linux, you've got a couple of options, and hey, they're both free because Linux is the land of free and open source. The first is AutoKey, and the second is a newer project called TextSuggest. Uh, once again, for both of these names, uh, capital letters, each word, no space in between. Right, got it. All right, good. You'll find that AutoKey feels a lot like a text and Phrase Express and how it works and how it looks. I don't know which was first in sort of this chicken or egg mentality of how to design a UI for a text expansion app, but you can tell that there's a little bit of give and take and borrowing between them. Meanwhile, Text Suggests takes a more mouse-focused approach. For my needs, I prefer AutoKey because I like the things that I already know from Windows and Mac OS. But hey, give both of them a try and see which works best for you. Now then, let's take a quick look at what these things do, besides you know, just allowing you to type a short phrase and expand that into something different. Text expansion software not only allows for replacing one bit of text with another, but most all of them support simulating key presses. What I mean is that you can not only say expand the phrase EMA to your email address, you can have that expansion hit the tab key as well to move on to the next line in the email form. For instance, I have a few expansions that take something that's already been typed, move the cursor to the beginning of the line, do something, move the cursor back to the end of the line, and do another thing, and so on. You can simulate these key presses and use it to manipulate what you're doing with your expansion. It does this using the same keyboard commands that I would normally type, so it, it's pretty flawless. We'll get into what you can do with that in a minute, but the important thing to remember is that you can not only substitute phrases for longer pieces of text, you can also manipulate the things that you've already written. And finally, keep in mind, we're not just talking about text, we're talking about keyboard input. Anything you can type, you can automate with a text expander, and it doesn't much matter where you're typing. You want to see what I mean? You want to get to the real deal, holy field part of text expansion, you know? actually doing it and making your typing life so much easier? Well, okay then. When it comes to text expansion and automation, your needs are your own. Chances are pretty good that you'll have different requirements and desires than I do, so what I want to do is simply share some ideas with you along with some of the shortcuts that I find incredibly useful. Hopefully that'll spur some ideas and you can venture off and build upon my small library to create your own awesome expansions. Before we get started, let's talk a little bit about how to build your trigger, which is the thing you type to get something else out of your text expander. While it may sound obvious that you don't want to pick a short phrase or a series of letters that shows up in a word or is a word in itself, I've accidentally done that. The problem is, is that you'll, you know, you'll trigger you know, a replacement or action right in the middle of a word or right after you type the word. So when it comes to building a trigger, there's a couple things I would suggest to keep things future-proof and running smooth. The first is, I almost always end my triggers with a closing angle brace, like you'd see at the end of an HTML tag. The reason for that is, 
With most words and phrases and anything that you type in English, they won't contain an angle brace anywhere in it. It's kind of unique. And the fact that it sort of points right, uh, that indicates that something is moving forward, at least in my mind. Now then, I do write a huge amount of HTML code, both professionally and you know just for different little projects that I work on. And of course, in HTML, that closing angle brace is common. But I also don't set my triggers to be any kind of HTML tag. And that's pretty easy in and of itself, too, because all of my triggers really aren't words, where almost all of the HTML tags are. Well, 99% of them are. So I've never run into a problem where I type the end of an HTML tag or something like that, and suddenly it's replaced by a trigger or anything like that. It's, it's, it's worked out pretty well. The second is that, for the most part, many of my triggers start with a Q followed by any letter that is not a U. In English, a Q is preceded by a U 99% of the time. That way, I'm not going to create a word that actually exists, even by accident. I figure the Q is short for quick, and that helps me remember the triggers too. After all, what good are the triggers if you don't remember them? Not all of my triggers are like this, but a good portion of them are. So the moral is, don't use a trigger that's a word, and use something special to kind of denote that it's a trigger in the first place. If you can come up with a consistent pattern to follow, you'll find that you can remember these things really easily, and because of that, you'll use them more often. Okay, that out of the way, let's do some useful things. Do you have a Tumblr site or a WordPress blog or something like that where you tag items? I suppose you'll run into tagging in a lot of places from content management systems to ILS pack overlays. Either way, you'll find yourself adding the same tags over and over again if you work with some kind of management system where you're putting tags onto things. It could be Evernote, you know, for all I know. Some CMS solutions will offer an autocomplete or a drop-down to add the tags on. So you just type a little bit of the word and it'll, you know, it'll suggest the rest of the tag. And that's fine, but you know what's faster than that? Quickly adding the tag with a trigger, securing the knowledge that you're not going to mistype it, and the trigger will always replace it with the same text. So, for example, I have a Tumblr site where I post images related to cyberpunk, comics, fantasy, dancing, and all kinds of geeky stuff like that. I tag them because I can, and because it's easy to do so with the triggers. When I need to tag something as cyberpunk, I type QTC. That's short for Quick Tag Cyberpunk. And it's immediately replaced by the word cyberpunk followed by a comma. The reason for the comma is in case I want to add another tag. So for instance, I might occasionally post a cool portrait I found online and tag it as people. And I might post a picture of a dancer because I love watching dancers. Yes, I'm a fan of ballet, come at me. Anyway, a dancer is a person, so I would tag it as people, but I would also tag it as dancer. So a couple of quick triggers are QTP for people, followed by QTD for dancer. You know, there you go, quick tag people, quick tag dancer. Each word is followed by a comma because I've yet to run across a modern tagging system that can't deal with a comma unfollowed by another word. So even if it's the last word and the comma is still there, it doesn't matter. And that also doesn't matter which tag I trigger first, you know? You can also do this for tagging in any system, and it's fast and consistent. After all, you're using the same tags over and over again, which is kind of what you want to do when you're tagging things. So let's get a little geekier and talk about using triggers so you don't have to remember things. Now, on this show, we've talked about digital signage quite a bit, and as it happens, part of my job is to manage the technical and administrative parts of the library's digital signage system. These things run on Raspberry Pis, and they're all administered through Secure Shell, which is a pretty standard Linux thing if you're unfamiliar. They have their own IP addresses, and there are 19 of them. Look, I barely remember my own phone number sometimes. I ain't going to remember 19 IP addresses. And I don't have to. Say I need to secure shell into a digital sign at a given branch. I can look it up, which sometimes I do. But most of the time, I just type QSSH and the branch abbreviation. That's immediately replaced by the SSH command, the username, the at sign, followed by the IP for that digital sign, and as an added feature, 
I have the trigger hit the enter key for me, because why not? We'll get into more about using text expanders to simulate keyboard input here in a second, but let me start here. I'm going to hit enter after I'm done typing that command anyway. It doesn't do anything unless I hit the enter key, so I may as well have the text expander hit that key for me. So just like that, I've got all 19 signs on a speed dial with just variations upon a simple command. And that's the beauty of consistency. It's always QSSH followed by the branch abbreviation. It's got a root and a suffix, and I know both of them without a thought. And I'm not looking up 19 IP addresses. Building upon that, there are two things I do on a daily basis, almost as soon as I sit down at my desk at work. The library I work for has three websites that need to be up. And I want to verify first thing in the morning that everything is running smoothly. Because if anyone's going to notice that there's something wrong with one of those sites, I want it to be me and I want it to be me first. Now, I could open up a browser, type the URL, check the site, open a new tab, type another URL, check that site, and then do that a third time. Or I can make a trigger that does all of that for me. And here I break with convention because I don't start it with a Q. Because this was a this is an older thing that I did that I you know didn't start doing the Q at the at the time. For me, the trigger to make this is BVPI, BVPIE. I just say BVPI in my head, so that's I'm so used to saying that. But this is short for browser, verify pack, intranet, and extranet. Most of my triggers that are specifically for use in the browser start with a B. You don't have to do that. Do whatever works well for you. But for me, this helps me remember the things. Anyways, this trigger doesn't just type text. It runs keyboard simulations and automates the browser too. So when I type BVPIE or BVPI into the URL bar, this is what happens. Number one, it's replaced by the URL for the pack and it hits enter. The trigger executes a command tab, which in Firefox on Mac OS opens up a new tab. The trigger then types the URL for the extranet into the browser's address bar and hits enter. Then it again executes a command tab to open up another new tab, and then it types the URL for the intranet into that new tab, and yes, it hits enter. In other words, with that one trigger, I'm opening three separate websites and three separate browser tabs all at the same time, and then I can just tap through them real quick to make sure they came up okay. That's really all I'm doing, just a quick visual verification that things are working. Pretty freaking neato, my friends. Now, remember I said I did two things. Well, the second one has to do with my work log status report thing that I keep. I keep a running file in Markdown throughout the day just to document what I've done so... At the end of the day, I not only have a log of the day's accomplishments, but I can refer back to that at any given time to see when I did something, or if I did it at all. After I do this site verification thing, I always type the same thing in my work log, which is verified pack, intra, extra, which of course is short for pack, intranet, extranet. Since I always type that, and since that rarely changes, and that only changes when a site isn't working, there's no reason to type that thing every day. Remember the trigger for BVPI? That was for the browser? Well, I'm not in the browser. I'm just in my work log. So it's just VPI, V-P-I-E, which, you know, once again, is short for verified pack, intra, extra. And it writes it out in my log and hits enter for the next entry. And hey, hey, speaking of markdown, let me tell you about a little trick I do for the show notes, which you'll find at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. I write almost everything in Markdown, at least as a start, and the show notes are really no exception. As I add links to the list at the end so listeners can go to the stuff I've talked about, I'll have a trigger to help me do that. First, I pop over to the browser and find the thing I need to link. I'll copy that link to the clipboard, you know, just Command C, and then go back to my Markdown editor. Then I type the name of the thing I want to link to. So let's use Phrase Express for an example. After I type that, I'll type a space and then QMDLINK, or QMD link, which is short for Quick Markdown Link. The expander goes into action by hitting Command left arrow to go to the beginning of the line, adding an opening brace to the beginning of that line to start a, you know, start building the link in Markdown format, 
It hits command right arrow to go to the end of that line, and then it hits delete on the keyboard. Why? Well, because I had an extra space in there, remember? I don't want that in my link, so I have the trigger simply remove it. Then it adds a closing brace to denote the text to link in Markdown. And right after that, it adds an open parentheses and it pastes the URL in from the clipboard. And then it adds a closed parentheses at the end of the URL. And with that, I've typed one or two words, hit my trigger, and made a link in Markdown. Just like that. It's perfect. I love it. You can do the same kind of thing with HTML coding and links in your favorite HTML editor. And speaking of which, you can create triggers to set up new HTML projects, new programming projects in general, some boilerplate JavaScript, filler text. Heck, I've got a trigger that inserts a paragraph of lorem ipsum wherever I need it. And that's perfect for mock-ups and checking text flow around images and the like. On the topic of boilerplate, I have a trigger set up to respond to all of the emails I receive that are asking for website event slides. It's a simple process, but I like to make sure the librarians and parapros know that I did indeed get their request and where they can track it. So after adding their request to my online queue, I simply reply to their email with one word, slide form. No space, nothing, just S-L-I-D-E-F-O-R-M. And just like that, a form email pops in that apologizes for being a form email. It tells them that I got their requests, where they can track the request, and where they can go to look at the finished slide to make sure I didn't make any typos or put the wrong time on it or something like that. It's got all the links, all the info, and I don't have to copy and paste anything. And I can do it whenever I get one of those messages in. I just simply add their request to my queue, go back to the email, reply, slide form, Enter. Done. You can use a text expander to fix little annoyances that you face in your daily routine and within your software, too. See, I use Macdown for most of my markdown editing, and while I love it, there's one little thing that bothers me. When I start a bulleted list, I can create an item with the star, you know, the little asterisk. That's, that's standard markdown. That's how markdown works. Then I want an item to have that sublist, which you do by hitting enter and then hitting tab once and then dropping in another asterisk. That's how Markdown works, but that's not quite how Macdown works. When you drop down, it'll automatically add a new list item, which is great. And then you tab over and it just tabs over. It doesn't actually create the sublist. No problem. I just set a trigger to pop that asterisk over for me to start the sublist. I don't even have to think about it anymore. Do you constantly misspell a word, or did something change and now you need to refer to it by a new name, and you find yourself using the old name? Well, I find myself facing that you know, with OS X or you know, OS X versus Mac OS. I've got a trigger set up that whenever I type OS X, you know, don't get on me, I'm literally saying the letters OSX for OS X, it automatically replaces it with Mac OS. And as things go, I can't spell privilege. I just can't. That is a word that I cannot spell properly. I put vowels in the wrong place. I add letters that aren't there. The funny thing is that even when I misspell it, I usually misspell it one or two different ways. So at least I'm consistent in my failure. And so I set a trigger to both of these misspellings to autocorrect it for me on the fly. Though, now that I think about it, that's probably not helping me learn how to spell the word either. Oh well, I think I'll survive, and I'm not misspelling the word and looking stupid in emails. Finally, when you're working with images and files as much as I do, sometimes you need to name a bunch of files with a unique name. Not only that, but it's helpful to keep them in order. Well, you know how you can easily generate a file name that's always unique and your operating system will automatically keep them in order? Add a date timestamp to them. Set up a trigger that allows you to append the date and the time or add it, you know, wherever you want to add it. I've got a trigger that pops in the date followed by a dash followed by the time in a format of year, 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 year. So, you know, a four digit year, a two digit month and a two-digit date. So say today is Monday, October 10, it would be 2016 10, I guess 10, yeah, 1010. 10. 
Then after that, there's a dash, and then there's HHMMSS, which is you know short for two hours, two minutes, two seconds. And in this case, I use 24-hour time. So literally, as I record this, it would be something along the lines of 2016-1010-2138-05, something like that. And as long as a second has passed since I last used that trigger, the file name that I put that on will always be unique, and it'll be easy to sort, because it's in numerical order. Oh, and one last thing. This is just a basic idea of what you can do with these triggers. You can literally set triggers within triggers. Like Dune, you can have plans within plans. Like, I could set up a trigger with my slide form email to add a date and a time to my, you know, for my date timestamp trigger, and then fire off another trigger that would insert a custom signature. You can use text expansion to execute scripts, and from there, you really get down into the more hardcore manipulation of your digital environment. The possibilities are limited only by what you can type and how far you might want to go with the thing. In other words, text expansion is a tool, and you should use it the way that suits your needs and makes your workflow easier for you. Whether you want to make use of a few triggers or you're trying complicated strips to do amazing things, check it out on your OS of choice. You're going to be typing anyway. You may as well make it easier. And so that wraps up another episode of Cyberpunk Library, and I thank you for tuning in and checking out the show. And hey, hope you got a little idea as to what you can do with text expansion and these things that you can incorporate into your digital environment and your workflow. Because I guarantee you, once you sort of make these your own and get it set up and working the way you like it, it's going to save you a lot of time. It's going to make things a lot easier. And hey, that's what it's all about. Aren't these computers supposed to help us? The tune you're currently digging on is Knowns by Beat.Dowsing. I hope I'm saying that right. It is B-E-A-T with a period dowsing. So, hey, I'm going to say Beat.Dowsing, and if I'm wrong, I do apologize, because earlier in the show you heard some great tunes from them as well, like Tropics, Albatross, and Dodo. Check the links in the show notes to uh, download those from the Free Music Archive. Lots of good stuff there. And this is some great down-tempo tunes that I ran into a couple days ago that I just had to incorporate into the show. So check that out. Check out the music, and I think you're going to like it. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted by the Internet Archive at archive.org. Saving and preserving bits of the Internet, the Archive is one of the greatest things in the history of the Internet itself. Not only are they saving and preserving really important parts of the net and some unimportant parts anyway, but they're also hosting content like this, like podcasts and videos and ebooks and software and video games. It's a great place. It's one of my favorite places online. Seriously. Check them out. Internetarchive.org. Great people doing great things. And hey, I wanted to give you a heads up on a couple projects that I've been working on that I'm really excited to share with you. And I think you're going to like them too. One is a brand new show that I'm going to be launching in the next couple days. Another podcast called Generating X. It's a show about sort of my generation and growing up in the sort of late 70s, the 80s, and, you know, kind of the early 90s. So the Generation X times. And this, you know, Generating X is literally about what made Generation X sort of Generation X, at least from the pop culture, music, video game, movie whatever was going on at the time kind of thing. It's a little bit history, it's a little bit entertainment, and I hope it's going to be a little bit awesome. At the very least, I hope you check it out. Just keep watching the uh, keep watching the feed from cyberpunklibrarian.com because that's where it's going to be hosted, and I'll let you know when it's out. And hey, the other project I want to tell you about is after over a year, I know it's been a, it's been kind of a crazy year for me, but uh, 
I finally hammered out another chapter of Intragalactic Librarian. We're doing a little bit of editing on that, but that's right, Skylar and Jessica are back, and we're going to have a little more high adventure in deep space. It's pulp sci-fi with a librarian twist. It's Intragalactic Librarian coming back to the feed as soon as I can get this up and running. Believe me, I'm just as excited as anyone else, I hope, to get this thing on the air. So keep watching the feed at cyberpunklibrarian.com, not only for Intragalactic Librarian, but also for Generating X, a totally new show that's totally not library related. So hey, that'll be a little different in and of itself. If you would like to get a hold of me, well, I highly suggest you do so. You can uh, you can hit me up on Twitter, where I am at Bibrarian. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian, but it starts with a B. You can also hit me up on Google+, Plus, where I am at google.com slash plus Daniel Messer, or via the old SMTP method of cyberpunklibrarian at gmail.com. For those of you who like to get your audio on a video site, I upload this show at youtube.com slash cyberpunk librarian, usually within a couple minutes of uh, it going live on the feed. I have to pull a couple levers, press a couple buttons, and sometimes there's a little bit of a delay, but it's not bad. It's usually pretty quick. And you can always join the discussion and find out what's going on at facebook.com slash cyberpunk librarian. And I think that's about it. I really hope it is. So thank you for tuning in. And remember, you don't have to be high tech to be low budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care out there.